Again, it's a pleasure to be uh, before you to speak to you from God's Word and hopefully you give your uh, undivided attention to it. I'd like for you to turn to the uh, fifth chapter of the book of John. We'll, we'll go from there. And we read in the fifth chapter of the uh, John that Jesus healed a lame man by the pool of Bethesda. A man had been in that condition for some 38 years. And Jesus said, do you want to be made well? <laughs> well, of course he wanted to be made well. I mean, that's a... But he, he didn't know who he was talking to, who spoke to him. He didn't see any possibility of being made well and said so to Jesus. Whereupon Jesus said to him, Rise, take your, your bed, and walk. And the divine record said that immediately the man was made well, took up his bed, and walked. It just so happened that the day he took up his bed and walked was the Sabbath. Rather than rejoicing, the Jews said to him who was cured, It is the Sabbath. It is not lawful for you to carry your bed. When asked, the cured man said he did not know who had healed him. When he did find out, he told the Jews that it was Jesus. And the record says, For this reason the Jews persecuted Jesus and sought to kill him because he had done these things on the Sabbath. Upon saying that Jehovah God was his father, the Jews sought all the more to kill him because he not only broke the Sabbath, but also said that God was his father, making himself equal with God. After a few timelier and pointed remarks about their disbelief, Jesus went over to the, over the Sea of Galilee for a little relief from the crowd, no doubt. But a great multitude followed him because they saw his signs which he performed on those who were diseased. It was on this occasion that he fed the 5,000. Again, Jesus crossed the Sea of Galilee to Capernaum. Again, the crowd followed him. It was there that Jesus gave them a lesson on the, the bread of life and that he was that bread. Furthermore, he told them that he had come down from heaven, not to do his will, but the will of his Father who sent him. The Jews then complained about him because he said, I am the bread which came down from heaven. And they said, Is this not Jesus, the son of Joseph, whose father and mother we know? How is it then that he says, I have come down from heaven? Jesus further said, I am the bread of life. I am the living bread which came down from heaven. If anyone eats of this bread, he will live forever. And the bread that I shall give him is my flesh, which I shall give for the life of the world. The Jews therefore quarreled among themselves, saying, How can this man give his flesh to eat? Then Jesus said to them, Most assuredly I say to you, unless you eat the flesh of the Son of Man and drink his blood, you have no life in you. Whoever eats my flesh and drinks my blood has eternal life, and I will raise him up in the last day. For my flesh is food indeed, and my blood is drink indeed. He who eats my flesh and drinks my blood abides in me and I in him. Now, skipping on down, these things he said in the synagogue as he taught in Capernaum. Therefore, many of his disciples, when they heard this, said, This is a hard saying. Who can understand it? When Jesus knew in himself that his disciples complained about this, he said to them, Does this offend you? It is the Spirit who gives life, and the flesh profits nothing. And the words that I speak to you are spirit, and they are life. But there are some of you who do not believe. 
From that time, many of his disciples went back and walked with him no more. Then Jesus said to the twelve, Do you also want to go away? But Simon Peter answered him, Lord, to whom shall we go? You have the words of eternal life. Also we have come to believe and know that you are the Christ, the Son of the living God. Jesus answered them, Did I not choose you, the twelve? And one of you is a devil. So there you have the uh, background to the question, do you also want to go away? Those that feasted on the lows and saw the miracles had every reasonable and sufficient proof to know that this Jesus was sent by God and what he said and taught were to be believed and acted upon. But such people had no desire or intention in changing their ways. They only wanted the free stuff. So his disciples had arrived at a decision point with reference to those who had just received and rejected him. They had seen the same things that they had seen, the ones who rejected him, and had heard the same things that those individuals had heard. Did they also want to go away? Peter answered correctly, Lord, to whom shall we go? You have the words of, life, of eternal life. Also, we have come to believe and know that you are the Christ, the Son of the living God. Well, that was the right thing to say, but Jesus cautioned them with this answer to Peter's question and comment. Did I not choose you, the twelve, and one of you is a devil? What is more lamentable? What is more devastating? What is more sorrowful? Is it the oppression that comes from without? Could it be opposition by those who themselves are opposed to Christ and to all who would faithfully serve him? No. No. The expectation of every faithful Christian is that Satan and his minions will roam about seeking whom they may devour. But we have the assurance that God will not abandon us if we are but faithful to him. If we resist the devil, he will flee to other more promising targets. But he will, of course, check back from time to time just to see how you're doing what then can it be? Is it not the defection of those who have tasted of the bread of truth with whom we have obtained like precious faith? For those with whom we have waged the good warfare and who had faith and a good conscience but have since rejected such and concerning the faith have suffered shipwreck, we indeed must shed a tear. There are reasons, excuses really, that the others quit following Jesus. Indeed, all who abandon the faith do so under some compulsion. Now, let us consider a few. As is the case of these erstwhile disciples, perhaps it is because they can bear neither the doctrine of Christ nor the demands it makes on their lives. When Jesus spoke of feasting on his body and blood, referring to the spiritual, they said, This is a hard saying. Who can understand it? And departed. Unlike the noble Bereans, they did not search the scriptures to determine if these things were so. The gospel is uh, offensive to many. It was not intended to please the fancies of men, but rather to save them. Jesus warned Peter that Satan wanted him so that he could sift him as wheat. But the gospel also sifts. We are made pure by adherence to his teachings, and in so doing, the chaff is blown away. Christ is the author of our eternal salvation if we but 
obey him. Hebrews 5 verse 9. But when it comes to our own selfish wants and desires rather than humbly submit to the will of heaven, we kick at the goads. Some go away because of their love of the praise of men, the trappings of power, or the gain that is likely to result from running with the rich and famous. Okay, maybe rich, maybe not famous, but powerful within their sphere of influence. It was said of those leaders to whom Jesus preached that many believed in him, but because of the Pharisees, they did not confess him, lest they should be put out of the synagogue, for they loved the praise of men more than the praise of God. That's found in John, the 12th chapter, verses 42 and 43. Now, some go away because of their companions. If companions cause one to abandon Christ, they are, they are evil companions, however they may appear outwardly. The more intimate the relationship, the greater the opportunity for the faithful to lose their faith. Certainly there is no more intimate a relationship in his life than that of, of the marriage relationship. If one is a Christian and the other is not, there is at least there at least exists the greater likelihood that there is a unequal yoking together, Second Corinthians six fourteen. Marriage without the love and reverential fear of God by husband and wife is a fearful mistake. I cannot point to an apostate from the faith and say the first step was this or that sin. It is not always the case, or, or so I believe, that the first step into apostasy begins with a sin. It may be that a compromise of a conviction is the first step. When one says that they will only marry a Christian and then compromises, who is to say that other compromises are not forthcoming? Do not think that you will be able to recognize the signs of your slide into apostasy. As the prophet Hosea wrote when speaking of the impending destruction of Ephraim, he said, aliens have devoured his strength, but he does not know it. Yes, gray hairs are here and there on him, yet he does not know it. Hosea 7, chapter, verse 9. Apostasy will creep up on you, and you will not know it until it is too late. If the Christian says of the non-Christian, I will win him or her, the reality is that the non-Christian can just as easily and with more justification say, I have won you already. What do you love more, the soul of the non-Christian or the anticipated state of marital bliss? If indeed it is the non-Christian soul, then your greatest opportunity to win that one to Christ is before marriage, not after. Is a non-Christian made everyone after marriage? Why, of course they are. However, I believe it to be the exception rather than the rule. Invariably, when faced with this choice, the Christian will believe it to be the rule rather than the exception. I recall from uh, many years ago, and the amazing thing is I actually remember her name. <laughs> there was a lady, uh, she was a Christian and a member here, that had dated a man who was not a Christian. While dating, he attended every service with her and seemed genuinely interested in spiritual matters. Here is someone she couldn't convert, or so she thought. She married him. Immediately thereafter, he sat her down and told her in no uncertain terms that he had no interest in religion and was not going to church services with her again. And that was that. And it is a result often repeated. It is much easier for the one who has taken up the cross of Christ to lay it down than for the other who has no faith whatsoever to take up the cross and follow the Christ in whom he or she has never believed. 
However dear the non-Christian may be to you, your union is but temporary, and you will be separated at the judgment seat of Christ, 2 Corinthians 5, verse 10. You, dearly beloved, had better count the cost of your own presumptiveness, for you will pay the price. Our attitude should be one of speak, Lord, and I will listen. Command, and I will obey. Of seeking first the kingdom of heaven, Matthew 6.33. Of course, we must have authority for all that we say or do, Colossians 3.17. The Bereans were more noble than the Jews of Thessalonica because they, unlike the Jews that we've talked about, searched the scripture daily to see if the things said by Paul were true. God, through Isaiah, had this to say in Isaiah, the 8th chapter, verses 19 and 20. And when they say to you, seek those who are mediums and wizards, who whisper and mutter, should not a people seek their God? Should they seek the dead on behalf of the living? To the law and the testimony. If they do not speak according to this word, it is because there is no light in them. He was warning Judah of the approach of Assyria, not to listen to the men-pleasers of the day and to render obedience to his word as their only hope of salvation. So it is today. Sound doctrine and obedience there, too, is the bulwark against apostasy. Therefore, study to show thyself approved, a workman that needeth not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth, 2 Timothy 2, verse 15. Well, what happens to disciples who go away? Quite simply, those who reject Christ and his gospel, if unrepentant, will lose their soul. That notwithstanding, until one puts off this tabernacle of flesh, or through some misfortune, no longer has the mental capacity to repent, Hope remains. Like King David or Peter, the apostle, it is possible for anyone to repent and turn again to Christ. God is not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. Second Peter chapter 3, verse 9. But all do not possess the tender hardness of David or Peter. It has been my experience that those who seem to be something in the faith, uh, more mature, if you will, the more recalcitrant they become to appeals for their repentance. Somehow they have rationalized their actions to justify themselves. Although they may intellectually admit that they're in sin, rationally they excuse themselves by ascribing some a uh, noble motive to their actions that negates the sin. Peter long ago wrote of such persons and all other formerly faithful persons as recorded in Second Peter, the second chapter, verses 20 through 22. For if, if, after they have escaped the pollutions of the world through the knowledge of the Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, they are again entangled to them and overcome, the latter end is worse for them than the beginning. For it would have been better for them not to have known the way of righteousness than having known it to turn from the holy commandment delivered to them. But it has happened to them according to the true proverb, a dog returns to his own vomit and a sow having washed to her wallowing in the mire. Now why should we not go away? As Simon Peter answered Jesus, so should we. Lord, to whom shall we go? You have the words of eternal life. Also, we have come to believe and know that you are the Christ, the Son of the living God. The Apostle John said in 1 John, 2nd chapter, verse 25, and this is the promise he has promised us, eternal life. Paul said that our citizenship is in heaven, Philippians 3rd chapter verse 20. Peter stated in 1 Peter 1st chapter verses 3 and 4 that God the Father has, according to his abundant mercy, begotten us again 
to a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead, to an inheritance incorruptible and undefiled that does not fade away, reserved in heaven for us. Christ is the way to the Father. Therefore, we should not abandon him. Jesus said that I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. John 14 and verse 6. Therefore, we must lay the proper foundation, as Paul said in 1 Corinthians 3rd chapter, verse 11. For no other foundation can anyone lay than that which is laid, which is Jesus Christ. Furthermore, we are promised the abundance of life in Christ, John 10, verse 10. We have the knowledge that our work in the Lord is not a worthless endeavor, 1 Corinthians 15, chapter, verse 58. Now, there are a lot more reasons that can be given, but these should suffice. So, the question is, have you not yet named the name of Christ and put him on in baptism? You and the black backslider may both be wallowing in the mud, but you still possess a tender heart. Will you tonight yield to the gospel's call? If you... Christian have gone astray, will you not make it right before it is eternally too late? We plead for you both. Will you come as we stand and sing?